Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where yesterday Will Smith and Disney made headlines once more as it seems the two are back at the negotiating table to discuss a different upcoming live action fairy tale. Now they first came to the negotiating table to discuss Dumbo and I think it's important to understand why that deal fell through to better understand this potential new deal and the obstacles that could undo it and also why the two deals are very different. All right, so so with Dumbo, Will Smith was approached to uh, play the father of two young children who discover an elephant with unusually large ears uh, at their circus. And of course, everyone thought it was hilarious because Will Smith is known for having unusually large ears. And Tim Burton is uh, set to direct that film. Now, these negotiations fell apart uh, and the rumor is because Disney would not pay Will Smith's asking price. Just recently we talked about how much an actor gets paid and how that's decided and when you're a big name you know you tend to have a, an asking salary that you know puts you keeps you at your level and you know uh, is, is equal to what your peers are being paid and you know that's the whole equal pay discussion about men and women uh, but you know it also has to go for are you an A-lister or not and if you're an A-lister you get an A-lister salary and you know I think it's debatable as to whether or not Will Smith is still an A-lister in terms of box office what he can deliver but he doesn't want to lose A-list standing so if he takes a pay cut that's going to just be further evidence that maybe he is no longer on the A-list so that's the reason that he would stick to his guns and be unwilling to take a pay cut. Uh, also, I think that Disney probably wouldn't pay him and he wouldn't take a pay cut for Dumbo, even if it is directed by Tim Burton. Sorry, Tim, I hope you can pull a rabbit out of a hat or make this old, uh, this old animal do some new tricks, this old act. Uh, but I think that Dumbo is a tougher sell. I just don't think that Dumbo could make potentially as much money, uh, especially because I think that Tim Burton himself has been hit or miss lately. Uh, you know, I think that he, he's so stylistic and I think his style doesn't evolve that sometimes people, sometimes people like it, sometimes they're like, I need a break from Tim, Tim Burtoniness, right? So I'd be like, I don't really know if this movie, and also circuses are just really not uh, um, in a good place right now. PETA is doing a very good job of pretty much putting them out of business. And you know, I think that, you know, Disney is going to focus on the behind the scenes story of a circus for the Dumbo film, their Dumbo film. And I think that they should be worried about whether or not they're going to be called out for romanticizing, putting animals in captivity and making them perform tricks in, in facilities and traveling around in, uh, in, um, pens and trucks that really aren't appropriate for them. For instance, I just recently watched The Zookeeper's Wife uh, with Jessica Chastain, and the whole beginning of the movie is about the Polish zoo, uh, the zoo in Poland, the Warsaw Zoo, uh, during World War II, and you watch it and you're like, you're not properly caring for those animals. So that could be a real problem for Dumbo. So I don't think that Dumbo could do well enough to warrant the salary that uh, Will Smith wants, and he probably feels that it was too much of a risk for him to potentially be paid less, right? He's like, I'm probably maybe not gonna deliver here either, so I'm certainly not taking a pay cut on top of all that. But now that he's con being considered for the role of the genie in Aladdin, that might be worth it to everyone to come together and compromise on maybe a little bit of a higher salary. I wouldn't pay Will Smith what he's asking up front. He's probably asking for like 20 million up front or more and back end participation. I'd say I'm only giving you back end participation because your box office numbers have been incredibly weak. And I think that you are somewhat of a liability. Uh, I, I think that Will Smith is someone who people might actually not want to see. They might be tired of him. And I think that that, I, that would be assuming a very big risk for Aladdin. I can understand wanting to go with him. I suggested Kevin Hart for the genie, but maybe they feel Will Smith, you know, Kevin Hart does very well, and he's certainly someone everyone talks about these days, but I wouldn't categorize him as A-list, and I think Disney wants an A-list Aladdin. Uh, and I think you can make a stronger argument that Will Smith is A-list because of his, um, his track record and just... He's such a big star, you know, his, his history in Hollywood, right? And also, you know, this is going to be a musical, and he, well, I don't really know if Will Smith can sing. He can certainly rap, but, you know, I think that if you turned Friend Like Me into a rap, it could go really badly with fans. How would you react to that? I think that, you know, the musical theater fans that love Aladdin so much, I think that would be very bad. And I think that's one of the problems that Lin-Manuel Miranda is having trying to go and work with Disney. That, But he can sing. Uh, but, you know, with his, you know, leaning on rap, I think that hurt Moana, and I think everyone's worried about The Little Mermaid to some degree about putting rap in there, uh, and I'm sure that no one's going to rap in Mary Poppins Returns. At least, I don't think so. That would be an equally big mistake. I do like Lin-Manuel Miranda, though. I'm curious to see, though, if he can transition. But anyway, 
Uh, so I can see why they would go with Will Smith. And I think that they have a, they've already set a precedent for casting a black actor in the role of the genie because, of course, a black actor has very famously played him and successfully played him in the Broadway version, which is at the New Amsterdam Theater, which is pulling in a lot of money right now. It was just, they were recently talking about how much, you know, almost uh, $2 million a week pulling in, and Aladdin was one of those productions. Uh, so Will Smith, I still think he's very funny. Also, my, one of my favorite scenes in Suicide Squad was when he was auditioning for Waller. I thought he was hilarious. And again, maybe he can sing. Uh, again, I wouldn't turn it into a rap. So I can see why they would consider him. But what's also interesting about casting him as the genie, uh, and this is for Guy Ritchie's production, uh, is that their casting, of course, is, you know, unknown actors of Middle Eastern descent to play Aladdin and Jasmine, which I think is absolutely fabulous. But when you cast a, a black actor as the genie, you have to come to the realization that you're probably going to have not a single white lead in the film. You know, unless you change Jafar to an advisor from a different country, you could maybe do that. But, you know, then you're going to change it around where the only white character is the villain. You know, you have, to, you have to worry about the message you're sending out there. And I think that would be fascinating to then see how that film would do. It would probably be more appropriate considering where the film the story is set that, that would be what your cast is and so I think they would be going for a level of authenticity which would be quite interesting but let's see if Guy Ritchie can deliver that level of authenticity and the pageantry and the and the turning it up to an 11 that people want to see in their live-action fairy tale remakes so I think this is all very interesting and I would be okay with Will Smith as the genie I'd be nervous about it, but if I were Disney, I would not pay him what he wants up front. I would just give him back-end participation, and I'd say, you shouldn't be worried about it, right? You're A-list. You'll be able to deliver at the box office. But I'm curious, what do you think of how Disney's live-action Aladdin is uh, um, shaping up? Would you cast Will Smith? What would you pay him? Uh, and do you think this is important that Will Smith do this? He's probably like, look how Beauty and the Beast did. I need this. So maybe he'll take, he'll, he'll take a little off his asking price. Uh, and then also, what do you think of the idea that there might not be any white leads in a lot, Disney's live action Aladdin? Uh, as it should be. Like, there shouldn't be any in Mulan either. So I think this is fascinating. So very exciting. All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the second story of the day, uh, when I first heard the headline, I thought it, they were making an actual movie about uh, Fahrenheit 451, but instead it's going to be an HBO movie, which is a little bit of a setback, but still, you know, HBO is doing some great stuff these days, and they have to be very competitive because now Netflix and Amazon are seriously eating into not only their viewership, but their awards. So I think that doing a Fahrenheit 451 movie is a good idea, and it's going to be directed by Ramin Barani a fabulous filmmaker who did 99 Homes with Andrew Garfield and also At Any Price with Dennis Quaid and Zac Efron. Those are two fabulous movies, very small movies, but really good. And if you're ever looking for something to watch or, you know, to stream, I would definitely put those on your list. Really high quality stuff. And you know, everybody talks about Hell or High Water, also a really good film. But I feel that these other films are also, you know, Ramin Barani's work is just as good and it's a shame it hasn't gotten the same recognition. Although, I feel that there was just something about Hell or High Water that I think was really resonated and covered. I mean, both At Any Price and 99 Homes are somewhat political or at least offer commentary on today's society. But Hell or High Water, I think, was interesting in how it talked about the banks. But anyway, he's going to direct this. And it's interesting because Ray, Ray, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 is like George Orwell's 1984. Two really strong books about a dystopian future. Um, that we get closer to, I think, sometimes every day that have not been strongly developed into a TV or movie adaptation, uh, despite them being two such famous novels. Now, 1984 is currently being developed by Paul Greengrass and Scott Rudin, who did Captain Phillips, so maybe we'll be getting a movie there. Uh, and now, fa finally, Fahrenheit 451 is going to at least get an HBO movie. And it's most famous for its book-burning imagery. Basically, like, the media becomes... Uh, really disparaged upon and they don't want you doing you know anything with like editorializing and commentary right so there's a young man who works burning these books he's a fireman uh and he'll be played by michael jordan i'm so happy that michael jordan has got this i really like michael jordan i think he's a wonderful actor but he decides to fight the system he doesn't want to burn books anymore and it, ca it causes him to go up against his mentor who will be played by michael shannon now, I think this is great, because, and I wish it was an actual fi outright film, because I think both these actors could use the break. Michael Jordan, so talented. Fruitvale Station, amazing work. Uh, I thought he did a very good job in Fantastic Four. It was unfortunate 
I think that really hobbled him as an upcoming talent. I'm glad in Creed he was so amazing, but he didn't get any recognition for what he brought. At the, the, they made it the Sylvester Stallone celebration, uh, which was frustrating, you know. But uh, I'm glad that Ryan Coogler and Michael Jordan both went on to Black Panther. Although, of course, Michael B. Jordan is playing the villain, uh, which could be a great role, but, you know, he's not Black Panther. And he was supposed to do a Thomas Crown Affair remake, uh, but after, you know, I think that, unfortunately, it never really came to fruition. It hasn't come to fruition yet. Like, it's on the books, but where is it, you know? Maybe, hopefully, he's just waiting till after he finishes Black Panther, which just finished filming, by the way. But he's a fabulous actor, and I would like to see him um, really become like a Will Smith in his heyday. Uh, then Michael Shannon is quickly becoming one of the greatest character, modern character actors, I think, of all time. I'm such a fan of his work. I was so disappointed he didn't get the role of Cable. I think he's really talented. And someday, Turner Classic Movies will have retrospectives on Michael Shannon's work. And you will see it. He was He's in 99 uh, Homes, uh, the uh, uh, Ramin Barani movie I just mentioned. And you will be amazed. He's so talented. I, I also recently watched Elvis and Nixon with him and Kevin Spacey. Uh, he was playing, Michael Shannon was playing Elvis. Such an amazing, nuanced performance. Oh, he's just so talented. I could not be a bigger Michael Shannon fan. Uh, he is the definition of a working actor. And someday, someday, he will get the recognition he deserves. All right, so the third story of the day is a big story. It's not really clickbaity, so that's why it's the third story. But it should actually be the most important story on your radar because it, has the most, it threatens your entertainment the most. And that's that the Writers Guild strike continues to loom and is almost looking like a certainty. Now, the last time the Writers Guild stru struck, it was a disaster, and it almost derailed the Bond franchise, as you might recall, and I've brought this up a couple of times recently. Uh, Daniel Craig has said, I had to work to rewrite Quantum of Solace on set because we didn't have any writers because they were on strike, and, he, and Daniel Craig admitted, I'm not a writer. And you can see how, that made, how the film turned out as a result. Also, Netflix has warned in its net recent uh, talk with investors that they fear a writer's strike because, you know, they're a machine just pumping out content over there. And if there's a writer's strike, that's going to grind to a halt. And it's, as you can see, we talked about people subscribing and unsubscribing based on if there's anything on uh, Netflix they want to watch. So if they stop the stream of output, they're going to lose a lot of subscribers. So it's a big problem. So... What is the, again, just to refresh your uh, memory, the Writers Guild strike, what they're currently upset about is that the changes in the industry are not being reflected in their pay rates. So it used to be that if you wrote for a network television show, which is where all the eyeballs were, you had a really nice job. It was the cushiest job a screenwriter could get. And therefore, it was reflected in the dues they paid to the union, the Writers Guild. But now, as all the eyeballs migrate to digital and cable, both premium and, uh, you know, uh, channels like FX, those old pay rates when nobody was watching those channels remain. So if you're a, and also they're shortened seasons. It used to be 22 to 23 episodes. Now it's like eight to 13. So you're getting paid much less money for less episodes. And, and that's not changing even though the increase in the um, revenue from these shows is changing because now more people are watching them and they're winning awards. So the Writers Guild is like, where's our cut? You know, especially because TV is driven by story. I think it's perfectly reasonable. Uh, but they cannot make, you know, the Writers Guild and the studios cannot come to a, a, an agreement. So the Writers Guild feels that their only option is to threaten a strike. And to be able to threaten a strike means you have to actually be willing to strike. Because they feel otherwise, they're just not going to get what they want. Uh, they're also fighting for diversity hires, etc. But anyway... This is coming up fast. They, it looks like in a meeting that they had last night, it looks like the union members, have, they, which have to approve a strike, they have to say you can put a strike into effect because, you know, it affects their, pay, their payment. If there's a strike, no one can work, no one gets paid. And these last time it went on for like almost a year. So, but they're authorizing it because, and because of the reasoning that if they don't authorize it, they'll never, there's no way they're going to get what they want. And hopefully now with the added pressure of Netflix needing writers, et cetera, that'll, and television being so strong, certainly a lot more strong, uh, a lot stronger than it was back when the other writer's strike happened, maybe it won't take so long once a strike begins to end that strike. So they are moving forward and it looks like a strike probably will go into effect if they don't reach a, uh, an agreement, but when their current contract is up, which is midnight, May 1st. That's really soon. So keep an eye on this story uh, because it's going to have a, a, an instant effect on what you're watching. It would also affect all the uh, television shows, like late night shows, all the jokes, all the, you know, nobody could write. It's, it's bad. So we'll see.
All right, so for the viewer question today, this isn't from anyone specific because a number of you asked me about this. Uh, yesterday I was talking about Carmen San Diego, um, and I was talking about an actress, Anna Dar Arnas, from War Dogs. And I talked about the fact that I really liked her work and I thought she was very likable as a person, as a personality, even though she'd done a lot of nudity in the past, which I have a problem with. And a couple of you said, what's your problem with actors doing nudity? So I wanted to explain. So, well, there's some actors like Kate Winslet who just is like, that's kind of like her thing. She's like, oh, can I be naked in this? It's like, you know, Matthew McConaughey, can I take my shirt off in this? And you know, Matthew McConaughey suffered for that, I feel, to some degree. Uh, but you know, Kate Winslet is Kate Winslet. So anyway, the reason I have a problem with uh, nudity is I think that it, for more often than not, having to do nudity in a project falls on actresses. So when actresses are willing to do nudity, I think it reinforces a very negative idea, a stereotype that women are only valued for their looks and being eye candy and decoration, right? I mean, how often, I mean, when these actresses have to do nude roles, are they playing dynamic uh, characters who have meaningful roles in the film? Like, do they have great story arcs? If, they, if, that, if that then included a nude scene, whatever. That's, I mean, I would still have a problem with it, and I'll explain why. Uh, but at least it wouldn't be as bad as it is now. Often when these actresses start out, they do nudity in these roles where they're just the girlfriend or the hot chick next door or the hot girl at work, right? And that's all they are. They're really just there to be naked, right? I mean, take for instance, I mean, it ha certainly helped her career, Margot Robbie and Wolf of Wall Street, but that wasn't like a great role that she played, right? I mean, she looked gorgeous uh, and she certainly got a lot of attention, but it wasn't a meaty role. But that's the price she had to pay to get her name up there. And now Margot Robbie's, you know, doing quite well. Uh, well I don't know. I think that she's doing pretty well. Harley Quinn's obviously a very popular character, uh, which has a lot of, you know, also uh, eye candy is a big part of that as well. Uh, but I, do, I, don't, I think, and I think to, if you ever sense that something's holding Margot Robbie back a little bit, I think that's part of what it is. That that's, you know, she didn't get to where she is because of her acting ability. It's because she was willing to do full frontal, like total nudity all the way. Uh, and so, and you'll see that's very rarely called on for guys, which I, so I think that that is a problem that I think that it puts women in a box in terms of what they, what, why they're in a movie, right? Why are women in a movie? to be naked. And so you have like eye candy and then the guys will go have the cool discussions and the great lines and the great scenes. And then a woman will come back in and be naked again. And you're like, what? The other problem is, is that I feel that actors are supposed to be entertainers and storytellers. So adding this, this regularity, the necessity of nudity to what an actor needs to do, I think is troubling. Imagine if you had, a, uh, if there was a little kid in your life or you even, and you're watching, and you're like, I want to be an actor. Oh, I go to the movies every weekend, and I love seeing the people up on screen, and it's so exciting, and I love what they bring to the table, and I want to give that experience to other people, right? Now imagine that someone says to you, okay, if you want to be an actor, you, I can guarantee you that you're going to have to be fully nude on camera. You're going to have to show your breasts, perhaps also, you know, your the bottom half, your, your butt, you're going to have to simulate sex, and you need to totally be willing to do that, okay? And also, you have to interact in a sexual manner with an actor who you have no idea where they've been. I mean, look at the Charlie Sheen controversy where he was going around doing kissing scenes with uh, actresses having uh, HIV and not uh, AIDS, actually. I, I don't know if, it, I, I think it, that was an issue. Um, and, you know, exposing them to potentially catching that, that virus. Uh, so... It's, it's, you know, that's why there's the porn industry, okay? Now, I think that the reason a lot of times people are like, oh, you're being ridiculous, is because this isn't a problem for guys. So think about the fact that if you, as a guy, if you wanted to be an actor, you're gonna have to go full frontal. Guaranteed, you're gonna have to do full frontal nudity to be an actor. That's, you know, you can't be an actor if you're not willing to. And I don't think that's appropriate to call upon people to do in, some, in a craft that's supposed to be about entertaining. If people want to be t titillated, they can go watch porn. There's a whole industry to service that need. I don't see why you have to, you know, you know, I thought that spoof about it's not porn, it's HBO was really brilliant because HBO, of course, I think is guilty for blurring this line in the first place. And they were so successful because people were like, oh, it's acceptable porn. I can watch this porn and I don't have to feel like I'm watching porn, right? You know, I can tell people, oh, yeah, I watched I watched Game of Thrones and everyone's like, oh, that's fine. Uh, and so then all the other competitors were like, oh, man, we're losing eyeballs to the to the respectable porn over on HBO. We better create some ourselves. For instance, I love the show Billions, but I think maybe they're slipping a little, they're not as competitive in the ratings as they'd like to be. And I think maybe not last week's episode, but the one before, they added a, a significant amount of 
you know, graphics, you know, sex acts, you know, discussion of that, I think because they feel that's what they need to do to be competitive. And that's, I think, on some level, sort of sad. So, and also PG-13 continues to be the most valuable rating. So that's my problem with it. I think that to create a situation where if you want to be an actress, or maybe even eventually it's going to be something that's universal, if you want to be an actor or an actress, you're going to have to simulate sex, you're going to have to kiss and rub all over people you don't know, you don't know where they've been, and you're going to have to, you know, you have to do full frontal nudity. And just think about that. Think about, I mean, I know a lot of you want to be actors and you have to ask yourself, is that something you're willing to do? And how are you going to feel? And your parents are like, how's the job going? You're going to be like, oh, it was great. I went full frontal today. It's going to be on every screen in the world. I can't wait for you to watch it with me. Just, just, so just think about that. That's my, that's my problem with it. All right. So, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of spirited discussion about it down below. All right. I was polite. I hope you'll be polite as well. All right, write your thoughts down below. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please write it down below, not only your thoughts on the viewer question, but also the top three stories of the day. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.